Well, good evening tonight. I uh, trust that you've had a wonderful day in the Lord today, and I uh, trust that you've enjoyed the services this morning. Um, I know that uh, the Lord spoke to my heart. Hey, take just a moment right now and uh, check in. Make sure that we uh, know where you're watching from and, and uh, who's watching, and then maybe write down something uh, in the comments tonight, just as everybody's gathering and starting to get uh, get online, uh, write down something that you're grateful for. Really, truly, something, someone uh, that you're grateful for. And this is beginning week of, of Thanksgiving, and we want to make sure that we cultivate a grateful heart. Uh, that's so easy in our world today to uh, to grow calloused and uh, to just get so cold uh, to uh, to life. And I want you tonight to to think about as we go into this week uh, what it is that you can thank God for, something to praise God for, and to put that down uh, in the comment. It might it might just cause somebody else to say, "Oh man, I." I I need to be thankful for them, or I need to be thankful for that in my life. So go ahead and put that down right now. Take just a moment, uh, share this page, make sure that others know that they can join us right now as we open the Word of God. And uh, this is going to be a wonderful week. I want you to remember, uh, as a church family, that our midweek service, which is normally on Wednesday, will be moved to a, to a praise Thanksgiving service this Tuesday night. It'll be right here and uh, at the church, seven o'clock. Uh, make sure that um, make sure that you're here, and we're gonna take some time for testimonies and to sing together and to hear a challenge uh, about uh, gratitude or thanksgiving from the Word of God and the things that we really need to be challenged in at this time. And so, uh, don't overlook that service. It's a very important time to get your family. Make this an important time for your family to say. Thanksgiving belongs to the Lord, and we're going to go, we're going to gather with God's people on Tuesday evening, and we're going to uh, give praise to the Lord, and we're going to teach that to our children, how important that is, and so I want to encourage you to be there this Tuesday night. Also, don't forget about the Grateful Heart Project. This is an opportunity for us to uh, to provide a Thanksgiving meal for about 50 families or so. And not only that, but we want to have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And, um, and so uh, remember the details that we talked about this morning. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a bag, make sure that you, you get that in by tomorrow morning, if you haven't already. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are doing our part to uh, meet the needs of our area. We want to meet the need of the hungry and those that are uh, struggling right now. But also, we want to meet the need... Uh, with the gospel. And so I want to challenge you to be a part of this uh, Grateful Heart Project. And then don't forget some of the other things that we mentioned. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Christmas decorations taking place this Saturday, and that'll be here at the church at 9 a.m. if you want to come and help turn this into Christmas time. And I love this time of year. I, I just love the opportunity. Uh, Christmas uh, is, is such a nostalgic time. And it has the opportunity to to stir in people uh, fond memories and and things that uh, open the heart up. And there's an opportunity, and I'm excited about this time of year when people come to church and they sit in a Christmas decorated auditorium, and there's that feeling of Christmas. And then we have the privilege of giving the true meaning behind all of that and what Christmas is all about. And I really believe this will be a gospel saturated season. And so I want to encourage you to be thinking about who you can bring and friends that you can invite and be a part of helping get things ready for Christmas this Sunday. Hey, find in your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3. We've been going through the book of 1 Peter and tonight I want to bring a very, very important message. Um, this is one that every one of you at one time or another in your life is gonna need this message. And we're coming to it in 1 Peter chapter three. Peter has been writing to strangers, believers who've been scattered abroad. They're living in foreign territory. 
in five different provinces, uh, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, uh, uh, all over that region. And Peter's writing to them because they're going through persecution. He talks about suffering. He uses eight different words for suffering. And he's telling them, he's about to tell them in the next uh, sections of scripture that we're going to get into that there is a severe persecution about to, to come. That what they're going through right now is difficult, but there are more difficult days ahead. But Peter is not telling this with a tone of negativity. In fact, it's all based on chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. We've been born again. To what? Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, Peter was reminding them and he was putting them back in memory of the basis of our Christian faith that God gave his son on the tree, crucified, buried, risen again, so that we would have a new birth and we're born into a living, vibrant hope, not only in this life, but in the life to come. But can I tell you, Christian, that hope includes today. It includes right now. And Peter's writing to these struggling believers about the goodness of the hope that God has given to us. And I wanna tell you, these are days that Christians should be living and thriving in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are not days to be under the circumstances. These are days to be on top of the world. We need to be walking in uh, the glory of God and in the hope that he has given to us. And Peter is, is bringing this all home. He's saying, listen, there's no greater way to, to live this hope out than to live out this hope at home. He's talked about husbands and wives. He's talked about our, our, our uh, family relationships, uh, dwelling together as brethren, being pitiful, being courteous, all of those things that happen at home. Uh, Christianity begins in the heart. It is lived out in the home, and then it is a testimony to the world. Now listen, Peter is giving these believers the understanding that as pressure comes, it's going to come into the home. Let's make sure we have our homes right. Then he talks about those who are our enemies and how we should live for those, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. No, just the opposite. Be a blessing because we've been saved to inherit a blessing. We've been saved to be blessed. And we've been saved to be a blessing. So let's live up to our calling as a Christian. Do you not remember when Abraham was called out of the Ur of Chaldees, the very first time that God called Abraham out, he said, Abram, come with me. He said, get out of your father's house, out of your kindred, out of your country, and go with me to a, to a land that I will take you to. And there's what God said. And I will make you a blessing. And all the families of the world be blessed through you. And that's been God's desire for every one of his children, that God would call us to himself, that God would save us, and that God would put us in a blessing and then make a blessing out of us. And Christian, that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to do that in you and through you so that we can be salt and light in this world. And there's no better way to do that than at home and in the face of adversity. But then he's going to shift with these and he's really going to talk about a philosophy of life. He's going to remind them that all of this is possible. All of this is possible. Living at home, according to the word of God, enduring the persecution and living in the face of our enemies, according to the word of God, we can do all of that by being a blessing. Wives blessing their husbands, husbands blessing their wives, Parents blessing their children, children blessing their parents, Christians blessing the unsaved world and their enemies. And we can do that all by this biblical principle, this philosophy of life, this way of living. And it's found for us in 1 Peter 3, 10. And I want you to read it with me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, 
Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew peace and do good. Let him seek or let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it or pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now remember that these believers are on the threshold of severe persecution. And Peter's writing to them and he's telling them, get your home life in order, get your whole life based on the hope that we have in Christ and the hope that is in us through Christ, get your whole life based upon that. Find your identity in who you are in Jesus Christ. You have a God who is your father. You have a savior who is your brother. You have been born again. You are in the family. And now you have this living hope in you. Live in that. Walk in that. And he says uh, through this whole book, he said, now I want you to understand. Uh, this needs to happen at home. This needs to happen at work. This needs to happen in the face of adversity. You can live the Christian life out in hope. But he said, I want you to understand that all of this comes down to whether or not you are going to love life and see good days. That's what I'm speaking tonight on, how to love life, how to love life. You can love life. Now, sad to say, some people are not really living, they're just surviving. They're keeping themselves alive, but they're not living life. They're enduring, not enjoying. They're making life a burden, not a blessing. Listen, God didn't make life to be endured. He made it to be enjoyed. Uh, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is a God of joy and enjoyment. Sin has marred this world. And sin has made a mess of what God has made. And so uh, in this process, God has remade us. He has given us a new life and a new hope. And he says, now you can, if you will, love life. And you can see good days. But there are some things that you must know and you must do if this is to be your lot in life. Hey, do you want to love life? Do you want to love life? Do you want to see good days in life? Okay, well then let's look at what Peter is telling these people. And he's saying, listen, you need to remember, these are not people that Paul that Peter's writing to that are about to win the lottery. These are not people that are about to move into a brand new home. These are not people that are just about to take the CEO position at their job. These are not people who are coming into a great financial blessing. No, 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 no. These are people who are moving fast into a fiery trial. And he's saying to them, you're going to go to this fiery trial. And if you will love life and you'll see good days in that trial, then this is what you need to know. This is the philosophy and the principle of life that you need to be living out in your life. You see, uh, life isn't loved and enjoyed by people who have it all. And in fact, uh, I think about I think about Solomon. You talk about a man who had it all. Solomon had it all. He had education, he had knowledge, he had wisdom. Solomon had riches more than any man has ever had in all the history of, of time. Uh, Solomon, um, it is said that Solomon uh, sought the houses of pleasure. He laughed, he had comedians, he had zoos, he had peacocks and apes and ships coming in every year loaded with treasure from all over the world. Solomon had lands and kingdoms and houses. I'm telling you, he had it all. And Solomon gave himself to physical pleasure. He had uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines. There was nothing that Solomon withheld from himself. He had it all. Solomon pursued higher education. And Solomon pursued laughter. Solomon pursued food. Solomon pursued riches. Solomon pursued uh, desire. Anything that Solomon could set his mind and his hand to have and to think he went out to accomplish it, but he got old, as we all do. And the end of his life, it all came to pass 
Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes. He calls everything in life vanity, which is empty. It's all empty. It's all just vapor. It's all something that you can see that you go to get, but when you open your hands, it's not there. There's nothing attainable in life. Everything is vanity. And here's what he said in Ecclesiastes 2.17. Therefore, I hated life. Think about those words and think about who spoke them. Solomon said, I hated life. Hey, listen, life is not to be loved and enjoyed only by those who have it all. These people were people on the brink of losing it all. And yet the promise of loving life and seeing good days was alive and well. What a hope they had. This is a lively hope. This is what hope looks like in the face of of trial and tribulation and hardship and loss, a believer has a hope in him that he can love life and he can see good days. Let me show you what Peter says about how you can love life. And can I tell you, you can love life and here's how you're gonna do it. Number one, it requires the attitude. It requires the attitude. In other words, the will of a man. Notice what it says in verse number 10, for he that will love life. You see, uh, this is a man who says, I will love life. Now, don't confuse this with positive thinking. This is not some psychological mumbo jumbo that Peter is throwing at these people that you can just think happy thoughts and go to your happy place and, and uh, that all of life is well. That's not what Peter is doing to these people. In fact, he is doing quite the opposite. Peter is putting them not on fantasy, but he's putting them on the firm foundation of life and that it can be loved and that you can will to love life if you understand life. Well, first of all, who's the, or, uh, the uh, originator of life? Well, God himself is. Life comes from God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the life. God gave life. He lighted every man that came into the world. God is life, and he's the originator of it. And by the way, that's why we would consider ourselves pro-life. We, we understand the value of life. We understand the intrinsic riches of life that God gave it, that every child in the womb is a child that God has seen fit to give life to. It is the miracle of conception. And there it is in the womb and uh, it should be protected. Everyone has a right to life. Our founding fathers in this country understood that. Uh, our founding documents uh, ensure uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, let me tell you, believer, you and I have the opportunity to live joyfully and happily in this old broken world because we have the will to love life. And we love life because we know where life comes from. Life comes from God. Life comes through Jesus Christ. A life is wonderfully enjoyed and we need to enjoy it. Now, listen, this is not just the idea of being an optimist or a pessimist. No, no, no. See, a pessimist looks at the glass, it's half empty. The optimist looks at the glass, it's half full. But the biblicist looks at the glass and says, it's overflowing. Uh, my cup runneth over. And that's what a true Christian says. My cup runs over. You have to have an attitude of loving life. Now listen, the only way that you can do that is when you base your love for life on faith in God. Here is Peter saying to them, you can love life. If you will, you can love life when you know where life comes from, when you know who holds it, when you know who's in control of it, when you know the value of it. You have life. God's given you life. A living dog is better than a dead lion. As long as there is life, there is hope. And you have hope and you have life and you need to exercise the will to love it. Decide that you're going to love life because God has seen fit to give you life and he's kept you alive and you're alive today. And as long as you're alive, you need to enjoy and love the life that God has given you. So first of all, if you're gonna love life, it requires the attitude. Number two, it requires self-control. 
Look what your Bible says in verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days. Now, I think all of us would want to say, I love life and I am living in good days. He said, here's what he needs to do. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Can I tell you, there needs to be some self-control. Let that man, let that man refrain, hold back his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Can I tell you, Christian, most of our problems and most of the things that rip the joy of life away come out of our own mouths. We get ourselves in trouble by the way we speak, by the attitude in which we speak. We speak ourselves into trouble. We have a tongue that is filled with iniquity and evil, and it needs to be restrained. Let me tell you this. The tongue needs to be restrained. Every one of us needs to learn how to keep our mouth closed. I mean to tell you, we live in a world today where everybody's speaking, very few are listening, and everybody is talking themselves into more trouble. In the multitude of words, there is iniquity, there is sin, you're gonna talk your way into trouble. I'm telling you, our homes get in trouble by our mouths, husbands and wives are fighting, they can, they can push each other's buttons, they know how to say the right thing in the right tone at the right time to make everything wrong. And that is a sin, it's a sin against God, it's a sin against your spouse, it's a sin against your family, it's a sin against yourself, and we need self-control. I think every Christian needs to spend time and memorize James chapter three, and you'll find in James chapter three, in verse number two, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Here's what he's saying. A man who does not offend with his words is a man who has himself under control. Notice what he says. He says in verse number five, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. One little spark can set, set off a giant forest fire. We're familiar with that here, aren't we, in northern Colorado? Uh, there we've seen the forest burn and it can just be a little campfire. It can be one little unattended fire. Somebody can throw a cigarette into the bushes and one little fire can kindle a massive raging forest fire. And that's exactly what we can do with one word. One little word can set off a fire of rage. The Bible says in verse number six, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Do you know you have a whole world of iniquity in your mouth? Yes, you do. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. <laughs> I mean, these are strong words about the tongue. Our tongue is a world of iniquity and it's been set on fire by hell. That's why God had to bathe it in saliva, put it behind two rows of ivory bars and seal it with two guards called your lips to keep that mouth closed. Now listen, if you're going to love life, you're going to have, to have control over what you say. Now we ought not to speak evil. We ought not to speak guile. We ought not to speak evil words and injurious words at other people. We need to never have deceit and lying in our mouth. Listen, I'm telling you, churches are destroyed by gossip. Churches are destroyed by lies. People run their mouths and cause all kinds of confusion. They speak about things that are not their business. They get into things that are not their business. They create trouble and it comes from the tongue. I believe every Christian ought to pray every day, Psalm 141 and verse three, when the psalmist said, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Set a watch, I mean, that's a guard. Put a guard on my mouth and keep the doors of my lips. Lord, help me to keep those lips closed. You know, um, uh, we need to be we need to be aware. We need to be aware of how much trouble our tongues can do. And if you're going to love life, don't get yourself in trouble by running your mouth. And Peter was so aware of the harsh consequences of words spoken in um, 
the wrong way at the wrong time. Didn't Peter do that? Peter spoke the wrong words and he had consequences about that. I never knew the man. Peter lied about knowing Jesus. He denied Jesus Christ. Uh, he spoke words with his mouth and he immediately regretted it and got himself in trouble. And Christian, we should never have deceit in our tongues, lies in our tongues. We better learn to speak the truth and speak it in love. Speaking the truth in love. Paul told us in the book of Colossians that we are to season our words with salt. He said, put grace in your mouth and season your words with salt. Listen, we need to make sure that our words taste good. Hey, always taste your words before you speak them because you're gonna have to eat them one day and make sure that you have self-control. Listen, if you're gonna love life, guard your mouth. Number three, number three, we have attitude, the will. If I'm gonna love life, I've got a will to do it based on who gave me life. I've got to have self-control. And number three, this might sound unusual. If I'm going to love life, then I have to have a life filled with hate and love. Uh, I need to have a life filled with hate and love. Look at verse, uh, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 11. Let him eschew evil and do good. Now that word eschew is a very interesting word. Uh, it means, uh, has the idea of to eschew or, or to get out, uh, get it away, detest it, abhor it, uh, get it away from you, uh, spew it out, to eschew evil. It is an, it is a, an abhorring, a loathing, a hatred for that which is evil. Christian, if you're gonna love life, you have to learn to hate sin. Not just not like it, I'm talking about hate sin. Oh, you're gonna have to look at sin and hate it. And by the way, it's easy to hate the sin that we see in other people and not hate the sin that we see in ourselves. I'm talking about looking inwardly in your own heart and seeing the sin that is in you and hating that sin and putting it to death with the cross of Calvary overcoming it and conquering it and hating it. Listen, you need to do to your sin what God did to your sin, and that was crucify it. And you need to put sin to death. You need to hate sin. You see, uh, your, your life, if you're gonna love life, your life needs to be filled with hatred. You need to hate sin. And also need to be filled with love, you need to love that which is good and do good. Hate evil and do good. That's exactly what Paul had in mind when he wrote the book of Romans, uh, chapter 12 and verse number nine, Paul said, let love be without dissimulation. That's without hypocrisy. Uh, don't, don't love hypocritically. Don't say that you love something or someone and then, uh, and then do things that would hurt them. That's hip hypocritical. Paul said, no, 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 love. If you're gonna love this, person, then you need to hate things that will hurt that person. In other words, if, uh, if you really love your children, you're going to hate uh, rattlesnakes. You're going to hate the things that would hurt them. Now, you're going to always be aware of the things that could destroy them. And so he said, let love be without dissimulation. Here's what Paul said, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Hey, if you're going to love life, you're going to have to learn to hate and love. You see, now Peter puts it into an action. You hate, you eschew, you get rid of, you, you throw from you evil, and you run to do good. This is the action. This is exactly what Joseph did in Genesis 39. Joseph was being tempted by Potiphar's wife, and he pushed that away in so much that he left his coat, and he ran to go do good. And listen, uh, this is what a believer needs to understand. If you're going to love your life, if you're going to see good days, you need to abhor evil and do good. And the, the fourth thing I want to call your attention to is you need to seek peace. Hey, if you're going to love life, you need to be a peace seeker. Now, listen to me. Peter's not in any way making reference here to peace by compromise. We don't, we don't seek peace as Christians by compromising. No, 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 we just already set, we already set the standard that we hate sin. We don't compromise with sin in our lives, 
We don't seek peace by compromising with sin and with unrighteousness, but no, rather, this is peace through strength, strength of character, strength of testimony, strength of righteousness. He said, I want you to seek peace. I want you to do good in a situation where if you did evil, it would only create more evil. And then you'd have two people doing evil and you'd fill the world with more evil. No, no, no. As a Christian, when evil is present, you do good and that brings peace. There's a balance to all of this. A Christian doing good in an evil world is a Christian who's seeking peace. And by the way, that's what God's instruction in Jeremiah 29 to his people who were in captivity, they were living in Babylon, living under Nebuchadnezzar, living in a pagan, a very wicked, idolatrous world. And God's instruction to them was to seek the peace of the city that they live in. Listen, he said, don't compromise with the Babylonians, but seek peace with them. Do right, do good while you're there. Now, they may not like that good. In fact, Peter even told us before, they may even speak evil of your good, but you do good anyway because good brings peace. Why? Because good brings the blessings of God. And so he said, I want you to seek peace. I, I, wanna, I want you to remind, I remind you that when we as Christians live with God's wisdom, the first thing that wisdom, wisdom is is peaceable. James 3, 17, the wisdom that cometh from above is first peaceable. God's wisdom is, God, when you're walking in God's wisdom, you're always gonna seek the, the route of peace. You're gonna be a peacemaker in your home. You're gonna seek peace with your coworkers. You're gonna seek peace. You're not gonna be going around with a chip on your shoulder looking to start a fight. You're not gonna be angry all the time. You're gonna be looking for peace, pursuing peace, pursuing peace, doing what's right. And so uh, God's people who walk in God's wisdom, God's wisdom is peaceable. Not only that, Matthew tells us in Matthew 5, 9, 5, 9 Jesus told us, that the children of God are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. God's children are peacemakers. Why? Because they have the peace of God in them, and they let that peace of God come through them, and they're always seeking peace. And then the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 that the people of God are are uh, working hard to keep peace. Uh, Paul told the, the people of Rome, he said, uh, you, uh, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. He said, listen, don't be a brawler. The world's full of angry people. It's full of people who are ready to fight at the drop of a hat and they'll provide the hat. I mean, they're angry, they're angry. God's people should not be angry. We should be peaceable. We should be peacemakers. We should be seeking peace by doing good. Don't go looking for a fight. Look to do good and overcome evil with doing what God has called you to do. I hope you understand that. This is a, a very valid point. You see, the people in Peter's day could have said to Peter, well, Peter, we're going through some trials here. And if we, we, if we become peaceable people, this is going to look like uh, the, the, the enemies of God can just take advantage of us because we're, we're weak. Well, no, no, no. Peace is not peace through weakness. It's peace through strength. It's strength of character. It's people who do right in the face of wrong. It's the people who stand up for righteousness in the face of sin. It's the people who, who conduct themselves inside their homes and inside their families and their way of life and their words that come out of their mouth. They conduct themselves in righteousness. There is a strength with that. And those people are not always looking to be brawlers and strivers and fighters. They're looking to be peacemakers by doing what is right. You see, Peter was living in a day where he's telling these people to seek peace in the middle of nations who were looking for war. They were wanting to destroy Christianity. And he's telling them to be at peace. Now, let me, let me finish this tonight. I want you to understand that we can love life uh, because of our assurance in God. All of this is based in our assurance of God. Good days, good days are not days that are free from problems. <laughs> good days are not problem-free days. Good days 
are days that have fear in them. They have trouble in them. They have brokenheartedness in them. They're days full of affliction. Uh, but they're days where we're going through those fears and through those troubles and through those broken hearts and through those afflictions. We're going through them with God's help. And God is walking with us. And God is delivering us from those fears. He is binding us up in our afflictions. He is answering our prayers when we call. And he has grace sufficient to the pain. You say, how do you know that? I'll tell you how I know that these good days are not problem-free days. Because this is a quotation from Psalm 34. A Psalm 34, verse 12 through 15, Peter is quoting from Psalm 34. You ought to take time to read it. These are days when the psalmist talks about trouble and fear, afflictions, brokenhearted, pain, suffering. And yet, he can see good days and he can love life because God is walking through this with him. And God is watching him. God is listening to him. God has his eyes on him and his face against the evildoer. Hey, can I tell you, Christian, these are days to walk in the love of life. Hey, don't be discouraged. Don't be down in the mouth. Get your eyes on the Lord. Get your eyes on God's word. Will to love life. Have self-control. Guard your tongue. Uh, hate sin. Love righteousness. And seek peace. Stop fighting. Stop warring. Stop trying to fix the whole world and just do right where you are. And you're going to find you're going to love life. And you'll see good days. And you'll see God clearly doing his plan. And the day is coming for the evildoers. That day is coming. And we're praying that they would be saved. But one of these days, they will be judged. And so let's love life. You can love life, and I pray that you will. Enjoy this week. Enjoy this time of Thanksgiving. Think about how much you have to love about, about life and how much uh, you've seen good in your life. Oh, God has been so good. Father, I pray tonight that this will truly be a week of thanksgiving, a week of gratitude, a week of people in our church loving life and seeing good days and responding to life by doing what's right. God, good always triumphs over evil. And I pray that we would be people who would live in obedience to your word and see good days. Thank you, Lord. Help us tonight, I pray, to enjoy the time of this life with those that we love and those that you love. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving.